The subject of, of the paper I, I re recently published with Federal Trust, and the title is Getting Brexit Undone. That's the course of action that I advocate in the paper, and I give some ideas around how it might happen. So I will, if over the next 15 minutes, I'll give a, an outline of, of the main ideas in that, in that paper. On the day the paper came out, actually, on the, the 4th of July, uh, earlier this month, uh, coincided with a speech by Keir Starmer, the leader of the Labour Party and leader of, of the opposition, on, on the subject of his five-point plan to make Brexit work, as it's called. And I thought the timing was convenient, and I think some of the content of that speech speaks to a lot of the themes that I address in the paper. In the paper, and today, I will be talking about the Labour Party, and there's a reason for this. As some of you may have noticed, uh, over the last hundred years, British politics, UK politics has been dominated, not entirely controlled, but certainly dominated by two parties, the Conservative Party and the Labour Party. And at any given time, one of them has either been in government alone or been the leading force in a coalition of some kind. And that, that's been going on for about 100 years. So when we think about how things can happen in UK politics and how they might change, including in the area of European policy, it's really important to think about those two parties and what those parties think and what those parties are saying is important. That's inescapable. So if we're talking about undoing Brexit, how that might be achieved, how do we get there? We've got to look at those two parties. Of those two parties, one, the Conservative Party, is for the foreseeable future a write-off as far as that kind of thing goes and as far as many other things go I might add but I think the the Brexit issue is is very much remains central to the written off nature of that party and it's lurch into right-wing populism that's uh, uh, continuing uh, for our uh, entertainment or, or horror on on in live TV debates and through a leadership campaign that's going to be going on over the next month. That's taking place. But then we've got the Labour Party. The Labour Party is uh, more promising, or perhaps that should be less unpromising material for some kind of project of undoing Brexit. But there's a lot of work to be done with the Labour Party, which I discuss in, uh, in my paper. But there is reason to suppose there's more, at least more hope that the Labour Party might be a means by which we could get Brexit undone. Certainly its voter base and its membership base are much more inclined towards the European Union and were much more supportive of remaining before we left. So there are important facts in there. But there's a problem at leadership level at the moment. There are reasons for that problem, entirely understandable reasons for that problem. There are important electoral considerations while Labour feels very vulnerable on the Brexit issue. There are seats it regards as swing seats that have voters in them they regard as being very hostile to Brexit, who they feel they can only get back on board if they take a different line to being pro-EU and show themselves not to be as, as they and their target voters might see it, suspect on the issue of Brexit, not be about to undo Brexit in some way. That's the problem for Labour. It's not their overall voter base. It's not necessarily that suddenly... Uh, the bulk of Labour MPs have, have actually genuinely converted to Brexit or to becoming Brexiteers, but there's clearly a problem there with their electoral base and their response has been the one I'm going to talk about now. I think their response is mistaken. I don't think it will necessarily deliver even on the terms they hope electorally. I don't think that's guaranteed. I don't think you can really know, even from uh, expensive opinion research and analysis, how voters are going to respond to things, why they might respond a certain way, what will happen, how the context might change. But that's the line they've taken. And as well as being uh, not necessarily uh, likely to deliver the electoral outcomes, they're hoping of it, it's a bad policy and it doesn't make sense as a policy. It's self-defeating and it's wrong. And for those reasons, I don't think they should do that. I think they should change their policy. And I think those of us who are supportive, who were supportive of continued membership of the European Union, 
2016 at the referendum need to carry on being supportive of UK membership of the European Union. And that means supporting rejoining and voicing that view, including but not exclusively within the Labour Party and to the Labour leadership. I'm going to talk a bit, little bit about the speech I referred to that Keir Starmer gave on the day the paper came out. Uh, too late to be included in the paper, but very much uh, in keeping with the kind of views I was an analysing in the paper. And, you know, certainly didn't disappoint or, or did disappoint, depending which way you want to look at it in its content. In that speech, Starmer talks about what he's planning to do to make Brexit work. In other words, uh, seems to be accepting the premise that Brexit is something which has happened, which we have to embrace, and also that it has positives in it, that it can be made to work, which is a big shift of, of, of stance from someone who was opposed to leaving and wanted a second referendum in 2019. That's a big shift. It's something that's happened. And it, it, this five-point plan, including some fairly contradictory and also fairly implausible propositions, it included things like getting equivalency agreements from the EU in, in a range of areas that would, I think the phrasing used was, tear down barriers to trade. It included at the same time as getting equivalency agreements out of the EU, which in practice would mean the UK adhering to uh, EU rules if they're on offer at all. At the same time, it was talking about regulatory divergence in other areas, exploiting the, the, the potential to get a competitive advantage over the European Union by being outside. It didn't really discuss why the European Union would want to give this to us. Why would they want to give us uh, mutual recognition in some areas while tolerating divergence in other areas? Didn't expand upon that, but suggested that all these things were possible. It also very, very firm on the issue that we weren't going back into the single market. We weren't going back into the customs union. We certainly weren't going back into freedom of movement. Described freedom of movement as a short-term fix, which I thought was a very unusual phrase, because actually I think returning to freedom of movement would be a long-term fix. The short-term fixes are the ones we're trying at the moment of issuing temporary visas to people, letting people come in for time-limited periods. The long-term fix would in fact be rejoining freedom of movement, but that was very, very specifically ruled out, which interestingly contradicts the precise uh, commitment that Keir Starmer appeared to make during his election campaign in, in January 2020 when he's running for leadership of the party. So he, he said all of these things and then went on to an interesting passage at the end, which actually I'd be interested if anyone who's uh, on the call tonight would like, who, who, who was a Remainer in 2016, feels able in any way to defend this passage or see anything positive in it. But I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about this because I think it's very interesting and it speaks a lot of the argument I'm making. Uh, Starmer, towards the end of his speech, says, in 2016, the British people voted for change. Again, that's an interesting formulation in itself. The British people, well, which British people? Uh, some British people, 17.4 million people voted to leave, but that's 17.4 million people out of a country of over 65 million people. So does that really constitute the British people voting for something? I'll leave that with you to decide. Then, then Starmer went on to say, the very narrow question that was on the ballot paper, leaving or remaining in the EU, is now in the past. Now, again, very interesting phrasing going on here. Is that a very narrow question on the ballot paper, leaving or remaining in the EU? Sounds to me like a very wide question, a eh? very widely drawn, didn't really give us any account of in the way in which we leave the EU and what that would mean. Also, if narrow means... Uh, not very important. I think it's very important. And you know, if, if it's not very important, why would, would rejoining be a problem? So again, very interesting phrasing there. And also to say is now in the past. Starmer's hope is to consign this traumatic episode for Labour, which has divided its voter base, created electoral problems to, it, to the past by essentially accepting the argument of people on the opposite side and trying to go along and deliver what he thinks they want on their terms and is saying, let's move on. And that's the whole message of, of Labour. Let's move on. Uh, it's time to put this all behind us and get on with things. Similar to the way that we were told when the Sue Gray report, it's time to move on beyond party game. Forget about that. It's a tactic politicians sometimes employ. It doesn't always work out too well. It can have the opposite effect. It certainly did for Boris Johnson. I suspect it's going to for Keir Starmer as well in this issue.
then for me, the most in interesting passage and the most shocking bit, when Sama says, but the hope that underpins that vote, the desire for a better, fairer, more equitable future for our country is no closer to being delivered. Now, I certainly agree with the second half of that statement. Uh, a better, fairer, more equitable future certainly is no closer to being delivered. It's a lot further from being delivered. But Starmer simply seems to leave in 2016, which told us not to vote for. He told us to vote Remain. He presumably voted Remain was actually a vote in favour of a better, fairer, more equitable future. And by extension, those of us who voted Remain are presumably against a better, fairer, more equitable future for our country. Now, I think it's astonishing that he felt able to say that, but in a sense, it is the logical extension of the policy he's got, and it, it, it's where you end up. And then he goes on to say, we will not return to freedom of movement to create short-term fixes. I've talked about that. Instead, we will invest in our people and our places and deliver on the promise of, of on the promise our country had. Again, the idea that you can't do any of those things from within the European Union, that Germany, Sweden, Denmark, France can't invest in their people and places and deliver on promise. Obviously, that's all, all very silly. But I think it, what he's saying here is, nonsense and it's also dangerous insulting nonsense now it, it, i find that very disappointing because i i do not think keir starmer is anything but an intelligent person i think as as a labor party member i think he has achieved significant things for the labor party in some areas but to find himself in this position on the brexit subject is is a major shortcoming on such an important policy area and i recognize all the political difficulties but i think if he's found himself in a position where he's having to say things like this, which are a complete travesty of his own record and an insult to many of his own members and voters who voted in a way which he is now, by implication, saying was the opposite of what Labour stands for, is a real problem. And if you find yourself in a position where you have to say nonsense like this, I think it's a good idea to ask how you got there and maybe retrace your steps and see at what, what point you... You took a turn that led you into this cul-de-sac where you are saying things like this. So I will now, bearing all that in mind, I will set out what my position is on this. And I think, you know, where Starmer's ended up is where we don't want to end up. And I think the only way we don't end up there is by saying that we favour rejoining the European Union. If you're not going to say that, you're headed in the direction one way or another where Starmer has got to. And it's very difficult if you follow the logic of not saying that, not to end up where Starmer is. So first, uh, Brexit's a disaster. And this is being increasingly acknowledged from people on both sides of the 2016 referendum that there are huge problems arising from it. They don't always agree on what exactly the problems are or who's to blame for them, but they're starting to recognise that there are problems. I think what's lacking is a full appreciation of the scale and true nature of this disaster and that it's been a disaster because it was always going to be a disaster. The particular variables and the precise form this disaster would take could have changed a bit, but, but it was always going to be a disaster. And different leadership, whether from within the Conservative Party or from another party, is not going to alter that basic fact that Brexit is a monumental act of self-harm, which grows in its intensity over time, all the problems stay, they intensify, and new problems will be added to them. And we have to recognise that. And that's why the only way you can really undo it is by rejoining. But some other so-called solutions are being pushed from various sources uh, in, in response to this uh, increasingly manifest disaster. One is looking for benefits, which is partly what Labour's doing and certainly what the Conservatives are trying to do. Problem with that is benefits are thin on the ground and they certainly won't compensate for the benefits that we had as being members. Uh, if we're looking for regulatory divergence that might give us competitive advantage, which is what benefits normally means, uh, 
well, whatever Labour might claim, they're likely to involve lowering standards and protections, which isn't much of a benefit for those who rely on standards and protections, which is most of us. Uh, and also, if we do manage to find regulatory divergences that give us competitive advantages, the EU is likely to respond in a way that penalises the UK for doing so, either through taking direct measures against the UK or, for instance, through the WTO route, which they're already doing to some extent. So looking for benefits doesn't really get us anywhere. And actually what look like benefits are in fact the opposite of benefits and can create problems for us. Uh, then there's the other part of labour policy, which isn't really compatible with that first uh, idea of looking for benefits is individual deals and mutual recognition uh, they're not necessarily on the table in the first place and even in as far as they can be attained they only make limited improvements and when i use improvements it's always important to bear in mind they'd only be improvements on the appalling position we're in now they wouldn't be improvements or anything like as good as where we were when we were members and they don't deal with, with the fundamental problems. Nevertheless, they do represent a tacit recognition that Brexit is a source of harm. And once you accept that Brexit is a source of harm, the thing to do is undo it, not uh, put sticking plasters on it. Uh, I'd add also that this kind of individual deals and mutual recognition was the kind of thing that was being looked for during 2020, during the uh, Frost-Johnson period, and the EU were pretty clear on the level playing field issue that they're not going to just let us pick little bits off that we want and give us what we want and give us recognition. They want something more than that. They want us to, if not to accept their laws in full, to give some kind of undertaking that we're not going to depart from uh, from uh, broad regulatory frameworks and we're not going to, to aim for competitive advantage. So there are lots of reasons why we can't get that. And a lot of that really looks like have your cake and eat it stuff, which really is what Starmer's position is. It's a new variant on have your cake and eat it. So I don't think we can expect that to change, even if Labour do get into power on this kind of agenda. I don't think the EU position is fundamentally going to alter it. Going on visits to Germany doesn't actually mean that Germany is going to give you. We've been through a long history of thinking Germany is supposedly going to give us some kind of special favour and it never seems to materialize in the end. Then we, the one we hear is uh, joining the single market and all the customs union. Again, it's not really the answer. Uh, people sometimes float this idea because they think it will get us a lot of the benefits of membership, but somehow it will bypass the political difficulties, the kind of argument that rejoining would present. I don't fully buy that. I think it would create enormous political difficulties. There'll be all kinds of political resistance to it. Opponents of it will, will say, well, it's, it's rejoining in all but name, they'll have a point, but also it will bring with it uh, problems because we will then, as was wrongly said about being full members of the EU, we will then be subject to rules, laws, regulations and decisions that we don't have a direct role in. So it, it will bring back in, in real form what was called the democratic deficit and there'll be a lot more strength to the argument that we are being subject to things we're not determining so it's really hard i think to uh, to see this as the as the fix that some people regard it as and it won't overcome the political difficulties and again it's not necessarily straightforwardly on the table it hasn't actually been clearly offered to us by anybody and people sometimes say and i'll come back to this and no doubt we will in the discussion that uh, rejoining the EU isn't an option, uh, the, the EU won't want it. Well, who's to say that the EU would want uh, rejoining the single market or customs union either? It will, both things will involve persuasion and negotiation. If you're going to go through that process and all the political problems associated with it, you might as well go for the thing that you really need, which is rejoining, rather than the second best option, which still brings with it the political problems of getting there, if you can get there, and is very imperfect compared to actually being back in the EU. So I think I've eliminated the main options here. Perhaps some of you will have other options. I think those are the main ones. And that leaves us with the option of rejoining as being the only one that's worth pursuing. Uh, there obviously, those are the negative reasons for it. The positive reasons are it gets us back in the EU. Being in the EU is a good thing. I don't think that was ever really, really clearly stated to the public 
by politicians who are supposedly pro-EU. They never really made this positive case. Often the EU was presented as being not too bad and we're going to get some opt-outs from it and uh, hopefully it won't get worse. And don't worry, we're going to head off any possible problems that will develop with it rather than saying this is a good thing being in it's good. We should be part of it. That's what, what we need to sell. So uh, obviously the op opposition to this, you'll get assertions saying it's not possible to do. It's politically impractical. All of that needs to be challenged. The claim about there being a democratic mandate that obliges us to stay in the EU for some in, stay out of the EU rather for un, some indeterminate period of time that's created by the referendum. Well, that needs challenging as well. I think even the idea that we would have to have a referendum to rejoin at all should be challenged. All these things have to be challenged. There is a path to joining the EU. There's a legal path. It's possible for member for non-member states to apply to join. The rest is politics. I'm not saying it's easy, but I don't think we should simply accept the self-fulfilling prophecy that it's not possible. And really, just, just to conclude, as I said, rejoining is the only answer. The path getting there is difficult to predict. I'm not saying this is easy, but is that a reason not to attempt something? Certainly not. I think the problems of not rejoining are going to be very difficult as well. We're not going to simply be able to move on beyond the Brexit issue. The fact that people spend so much time talking about the need to move on beyond it should be the clue there. But it, it's not easy. It's not obvious how we will get there, but it is possible. And I think there's a big body of public opinion out there that's very that's potentially very susceptible to this idea, if only it were positively presented to them by leading politicians. And the way in which this process can start and the way in which I'm trying to start it now, amongst others, is by actually saying simply, we need to rejoin. Then we talk to other people who think we need to rejoin and we work from there. There are enough of us in a democracy to attain that. And that's where we're going to end up eventually, in my opinion. So why not just get on with it and say that's what we need now?